Today we're evaluating the Fresnel integrals using an unorthodox approach. That is pretty cool, and it's a bit similar to the time I evaluated the generalized Dirichlet integral using a connection to the gamma function. But before introducing the gamma function, I'd like to introduce a connection be between the two Fresnel integrals using Euler's formula, where we know that e to the i x squared equal the cosine of x squared plus i times the sine of x squared. So this implies that the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x squared dx equals the integral from 0 to infinity of the cosine of x squared dx plus i times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x squared dx. So our interest, uh, the integral of interest here is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x squared. Now I'm going to introduce a substitution going from the x world to the t world by letting the square of x equal t, which implies that x equals the square root of t, and this further implies that dx equals 1 by 2 times the square root of t dt. And we see that the limits of integration are not going to be altered by our transformation. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i t dt by the square root of t. And because the variable of integration is just a dummy variable, we can name it whatever we, we want, right? So let's name it back to x, as in we replace each and every t here by an x. So we have the integral of e to the i x by the square root of x dx. And this is where the gamma function now comes in handy, because I'm looking for an integral representation of 1 by the square root of x. And for that, I'm going to introduce an integral, another integral, i sub 1, as being the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 half times e to the negative t dt. Now this is, of course, the gamma function evaluated at 1 half. But I'm not going to introduce this directly. I want to introduce a parameter x as part of the argument of the exponential function. Now if we perform a substitution going from the t world to the u world by letting x times t equal to u, which implies that t equals u by x, and this further implies that dt equals du by x, this implies that i sub 1 equals the integral from 0 to infinity of uh, u to the negative 1 half by x to the negative 1 half times e to the negative u, du by x to the 1, uh, x to the 1, right? So it's just du by x. And we can multiply out the denominators here, and that will give us x to the 1 half, the reciprocal of x to the 1 half, that is, which is a constant in the u world. So let's take it out of the integration operator. And what we have left is the gamma function evaluated at 1 half. So this means that i sub 1 equals 1 by the square root of x times gamma 1 half. And because we were interested in an integral representation for 1 by the square root of x, we can write this now as 1 by square root x equaling um, the reciprocal of gamma 1 half, which is, of course, the square root of pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative xt times t to the negative one half dt. Now coming back to our integral i, which we can write now as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the ix times one by the square root of x dx, and we can expand this term using our integral representation that we found here. Now one by the square root of pi is just a constant, so we can write it outside we have an integral from 0 to infinity, e to the i x, times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 half times e to the negative x t dt, and we have this outer integration with respect to x. Now because the complex exponential is independent of t, we can switch it, we can uh, slip it inside the t integration, and we now have a double integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x, oh, 
almost forgot this, e to the ix times t to the negative one half times e to the negative xt, integration first with respect to t and then with respect to x. And now <clears throat> the question is, can we switch up the order of integration? Well, because we're integrating a continuous function of both x and t, by Fubini's theorem, yes, we can perform this switch up. So we now have the double integral from 0 to infinity first being evaluated with respect to x and then with respect to t of e to the ix times t to the negative one half times e to the negative xt. And because t is a constant in the x world, we can uh, take it outside this first integration operator, the integration with respect to x that is. We can now write it in this manner. And what we have left inside this, uh, the x integration is a product of exponential functions, which we can write as e to the, I'm going to factor out negative x here, and that gives me t minus i. So carrying out this integration with respect to x is quite easy. And I now have 1 by the square root of t, uh, square root of pi, times the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the negative 1 half, times uh, e to the negative x by t minus i divided by the negative of t minus i with the limits being zero and infinity. Now in the limit as x goes to infinity, the exponential goes to zero. And in the limit as x goes to zero, the exponential goes to one. So that means, um, yeah, two negatives canceling out. We have t to the negative one half divided by uh, t minus i integration with respect to t. And now what next I want to do is separate the real and imaginary parts of the integrand. And we can do that by expansion using the complex conjugate. So, okay, cool. That means we have the a reciprocal of the square root of pi times the integral from zero to infinity. And on multiplication, I'm gonna have uh, t to the one half plus i times t to the negative one half divided by t squared minus i squared. And i squared is just negative one. So we have t squared plus one. And we have now a couple of integrals that are actually very easy to evaluate. So one of them is the integral from zero to infinity of t to the one half dt by t squared plus one and plus i divided by the square root of pi times the integral from zero to infinity of t to the negative one half dt by one plus t squared. Now all you have to do is let uh, t equal the tangent of some other variable phi and both integrals will reduce to uh, similar structures. You have one of them being the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the square root of tangent of phi d phi and the other is i divided by the square root of pi times the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 by the tangent of phi, uh, the square root of the tangent of phi that is, which can be written as the square root of the cotangent of phi d phi and sorry about that this was a pi by 2 here yep and using a phase shift going from the phi world to the pi by 2 minus phi world both these integrals will be equal so yeah you're just integrating the square root of the uh, tangent of phi from 0 to pi by 2 so this integral here can be evaluated quite elegantly using the beta function. So writing the square root of the tangent of phi as sine to the one half of phi times the cosine to the negative one half of phi d phi. And this is one half of a beta function structure where beta xy equals twice the integral from zero to pi by two of sine to the 2x minus 1 phi times the cosine of 2y minus 1 phi. So if we equate 2x minus 1 with 1 half, it implies that um, x should be 3 by 4. By similar token, y should be 1 by 4. So that means our integral
is in fact one half of a beta function with arguments 3 by 4 and 1 by 4. And here the connection between the beta and gamma function comes in pretty handy. We can write this as gamma 3 by 4 times gamma 1 by 4 divided by gamma 3 by 4 plus 1 by 4, which is just gamma 1, which is 1, of course. And furthermore, gamma 3 by 4 can be written as gamma 1 minus 1 by 4, and this is being multiplied by gamma 1 by 4. So using the reflection formula for the gamma function, we have pi divided by the sine of uh, 1 fourth times pi, which is just pi by 4. Okay, cool, and this evaluates to 1 half of pi divided by 1 by the square root of 2. Now coming back to our integral i, which uh, evaluated to 1 by the square root of pi times the integral of that uh, square root of tangent of phi, uh, this now can be written with, with a 1 half factor and pi. And it was at that moment exactly that I found out I messed up big time because going all the way back to that substitution where I let x squared equal to t for this integral, I had introduced a factor of 1 by 2. Yeah, my bad. So all I have to do is now just reintroduce that factor of 1 by 2. So I equaled the reciprocal of the square root of pi times the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the square root of tangent of phi, d phi, and getting back this 1 by 2 factor that I forgot. And this evaluated to 1 by 2 times pi divided by 1 by the square root of 2 and plus the imaginary part of the integral, which is exactly the same in structure. So I have uh, i by the square root of pi, 1 by 2 again, the one I forgot, and 1 by 2 times pi divided by 1 by the square root of 2. Okay, so we can factorize pi as square root pi times square root pi, so we can get rid of one of them, and we can do the same here with the square root of twos. So yeah, got rid of them as well. And I'm left with one half of the square root of pi by two plus i times the square root of pi by two, i by two of course. And we can write them as uh, one by two is just one by the square root of four, right? So we can write them as the square root of pi by eight plus i times the square root of pi by 8. And this is what your integral i equals. And, and this integral here was the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x squared dx. And separating into real and imaginary parts using Euler's formula again, this implies that the integral from 0 to infinity of the cosine of x squared with respect to x equals the integral from 0 to infinity of this, uh, the sine of x squared with respect to x equals the square root of pi by 8. So yeah, that was really cool. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.